came in over winter break that year to clear out a lab space and begin um, the research team. So Will was one of those students. Um, we've known each other for nine years now. Um, he was one of the first three research students, and uh, he is now a PhD candidate at US, USC. Yes. yes thank you. USC, um, and he's a person that I'm really, really proud of. So, really to you guys. So, I'm here to talk to you guys about drugs, and I'm here to talk to you about them because I don't think many of you have put much thought into that, because at least when I was here, that wasn't really part of the curriculum, and it's something I think is really cool. So, first let's define what a drug is. If you ask a bunch of different people, you'll get a whole bunch of different answers. To a doctor, it's a drug is something that can treat an illness and helps alleviate disease or symptoms of the disease. If you ask a biologist, it perturbs the biology of a system. Like you can tell cells to grow, tell them to kill themselves, tell them to do a whole bunch of different things. Or if you talk to a chemist, you'll see that a, a, a drug is a small molecule that's very high affinity for a specific target and can perturb how that works. Do you guys understand what those, those three definitions of a drug and agree with them? Did I get nods or shakes? Okay, great. So, now let's talk about how you get new drugs. In general, like there are some enzymes that are catalytic. And when that's the case, like when, <clears throat> when you have a catalytic enzyme, it usually takes some reactants and turns them into a product. And at some point you go through a transition state. Are you guys familiar with transition states? Can I get nods and shakes? Okay, great. When you're going through a transition state, um, that, that is usually the highest energy state of the transition, and the enzyme helps stabilize that. If you make a small molecule that mimics the transition state, oftentimes that is high affinity for the active site of that enzyme, will bind the active site and prevent that enzyme from doing that catalysis ever again, or for a while, so long as it's sitting there. Does that make sense? There are a whole bunch of other different ways to target enzymatic um, enzymes, but there are a whole bunch of different proteins that don't do any catalysis, and it's much harder to, uh, to target those. If you do know how to mimic the active site, you can alter them to make other drugs. And you can do screens both in vitro and in vivo to see how drugs work. And what I'm going to be talking about today are pro drugs. <coughs> Has anybody heard that term before? Can I see hands? Wow. Okay, great. So, before a drug, before you get to, like, if you go to this pharmacy and you get a pill, someone made a drug. Chances are that whatever chemical they started with was similar, but it's not exactly what you're buying in the pill. Someone had to find some molecule that did something biologically, but then someone else had to take that and make it so that you could eat it and get the actual active drug into you. So sometimes it's uh, like some molecules aren't water soluble, and pharmacists have to figure out how to deliver those drugs. Sometimes there are a whole bunch of different problems but the big difference between drugs and pro-drugs are that pro-drugs are small molecules uh, that do cool things with proteins, and actual drugs are something that you can take and will have that effect. So the difference is primarily deliverability. Everybody with me there? Okay. So next thing I want to fill you guys in on is what drugs we have. This is a chart of different targets of drugs that are on the market today. You'll see that about a quarter of them target GPCRs. How many of you have heard of GPCRs? You haven't taught them about GPCRs? I don't teach biology anymore. <laughs> I have no idea what you're teaching. All right, in that case, I'm gonna go through a quick, a very quick uh, overview of what a GPCR is. So GPCR is a transmembrane protein. Um, some examples of these are like epidermal growth factor receptor. The receptor sits in the membrane, that being outside of the cell, this being inside the cell, and some, some molecule, like in the case of epidermal growth factor receptor, it binds the epidermal growth factor. That, that is basically going to tell the cell to divide, but the way it does that is through the receptor. The epidermal growth factor will bind the receptor, 
And then on the other side of the membrane, there are the alpha, beta, and gamma subunits of the GPCR. When you have binding, there's an exchange of G DP for GTP, and then the alpha subunit is released into the cytosol, and the beta gamma subunit um, basically dissociate from the GPCR but stay associated with the membrane. And those two send signals to tell the cell to divide. They're not always they're not catalytic, they're not actually enzymes, but they're cofactors that will help other enzymes. Yes. What's GPCR stand for for Oh, G coupled protein, G protein coupled receptor. So, and the G is like GDP or GTP. Sorry, I never think about explaining the little letters. Okay. So these guys go tell the cell to divide, but the way that they do that is by making other enzymes do catalysis, and not actually having anything themselves. So if you want to prevent the signaling of one of these molecules, but not one of those, it's very difficult to do that. As you can see, about a quarter of our drugs target GPCRs. The way that most of them do that is by mimicking the signal. So you can turn on a GPCR or potentially block its site and prevent it from working. But it's very hard to control what these subunits do. What we're going to try to do is do something that can affect how those two subunits work. Does that make sense? Okay. So. The first paper I'm going to talk about is the design of cyclic peptides that bind protein surfaces with antibody-like affinity. Unlike a lot of titles of papers, that one makes a little bit of sense, right? We're going to try to make a little protein that can bind something really tight. And we're also going to make it a cycle. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So right now what I want to fill you guys in on is the technique that this paper used. Can I just see a show of hands who read the paper? Okay. Who followed the paper? Okay. That's exactly what I was expecting. Awesome. So, mRNA display is a selection technique. I briefly mentioned how you can find drugs with selections and screens. The way a screen works is you take a whole bunch of molecules, and like let's say you've got a 96 well plate. You set up some sort of assay to see if you have a drug or a prodrug in each of those wells and put one of your molecules in each of those wells. And you look at the 96 well plate and see which one worked. Maybe you'll have a color metric marker to see like if it turns red, it worked. Selections are very different than screens. With selections, you can look at a whole bunch of different things, but the results that you get back are only the ones that worked. So what mRNA display does is it allows you to make a random library of proteins and chemically link them to the transcript. So you guys know about like transcripts and translation, right? So normally, when you make a protein, the transcript it's completely dissociated from the protein, right? Okay, well, there's a really cool drug called pyramycin, which is actually an antibiotic. Have you guys heard of it? Who's heard of it? All right, well, the way that pyramycin works is it actually enters the active site, or enters, what is it? Well, you guys are familiar with the ribosome, right? tRNAs come in at one site, and then we'll, uh, the, we'll transfer whatever amino acid they're carrying onto the growing peptide, right? Pyramycin will enter the active site and chemically link itself to the growing peptide and prevent further synthesis of protein. What we do is we take the transcript, link it to pyramycin, so that as the ribosome is reading our transcript, we covalently link the transcript to the protein. So now we've got a protein and a way to read what proteins we have, that transcript. So what we do is we take a trillion unique peptides, make a trillion different proteins, and throw them at a target. In our case, we're looking at GI alpha 1, or G alpha, uh, I don't want to get it wrong, okay. G alpha I1. Um, so we have that on a bead, we throw it, if it sticks, we amplify it up again because we have the RNA, we can reverse transcribe it, PCR it, make more, and continue and do more and more rounds of selection. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with how selection works, let's pretend you've got a box of toys and a dartboard. If you throw the box of toys at the dartboard, most of it's not going to stick. But things that are pointy might stick. So what you do is you take your box of toys, you throw them at the dartboard, take what sticks, and make a whole bunch of copies. Then you take that new box, throw it at another dartboard. 
take what sticks, make some more. And by doing several rounds of that, you can get basically find things that are pointy, probably darts or something similar. Does that make sense? So that's what we're gonna to try to do when we're trying to find something that sticks really well to our target protein. <clears throat> but now there's a huge problem with this, with mRNA display. The peptides that we're gonna get are proteins. Proteins degrade really rapidly in vivo. So we're making prodrugs. These are terrible candidates for drugs because they will break down very quickly after you take them. If you, take, if you eat this, you're probably not gonna get any of it in your bloodstream at any detectable point. So what this paper is trying to address is how we can make it so that it's more stable in vivo and hopefully make it so that this prodrug could potentially become a drug. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> so the way that they're gonna do that is by mimicking an antibiotic. Who's heard of cyclosporin? I have no idea what you're teaching these days. I don't either. Okay. So there are two things that you guys should notice about cyclosporin, or I guess three. First, kind of looks like a protein. If you look at the backbone, it goes N, C, C. N, C, C, right? Okay, you'll also notice that there are N methyl groups. Normally a protein does not have a methyl group attached to this N. You'll also notice that it's in a circle. Most proteins aren't in circles. So what we try to do in this paper um, is make our proteins look more like that antibiotic. When we're making our random library of proteins, we're also gonna allow it and incorporate a 21st amino acid. So, have you guys heard of nonsense suppression? Okay, don't worry about it. We're letting our proteins incorporate another amino acid that is N-methylated. So, who's, all right, so phenylalanine is one of the amino acids, and we allowed it to have an N-methyl group, and that way we're hoping to make it so that it degrades more slowly. We're also going to cyclize our library so that it looks like cyclosporin hopefully degrades more slowly as well. This is a big scary picture. It's just depicting how everything works. So the molecule we're using for cyclization is called DSG. Who's heard of a leaving group before? Leaving group? Okay, we won't get into the chemistry. We won't talk about that. Basically, what this chemical does is it allows you to make a link between two primary amines. So if there's an N at the end, like in lysine, or at the end terminus of your peptide, you can use DSG to make a chemical link between those two uh, primary amines. And that's how we're gonna make an artificial cycle. So it's not gonna look exactly like cyclosporin, but there's going to be a cycle. So these are the results of the study. So you see the first time they threw the box at the dartboard, almost nothing bound. After one round, a little bit stuck. By the seventh round, they were getting 10% binding at just above room temperature, which is remarkably good. I'll get into just how good in a moment. But then what they did is they looked at the sequences that were in the pool after seven rounds of selection. And there was a lot of homology. A lot of the sequences looked very similar. And there's this conserved region right here. TWYEFV in the middle of the cycle. Also, interestingly, at the same spot in the cycle. Which probably means that that's a binding motif for the target. Is everybody with me there? It's like, if you're throwing stuff in the dartboard and one region of all your toys look the same, that's probably important for sticking to the dark work. So then what they did is they took one of their, are you guys familiar with binding curves? Can I, can I get hands? Binding curves. Okay, so what a binding curve is, what? Okay, so it's basically trying to tell you uh, what concentration it binds. So who's heard of a KD? It's the concentration at which half of your peptide is bound. The KD for the cyclic version of the peptide they selected for was very low, um, 2.1 nanomolar, which was actually the strongest binder anyone's ever found to GI alpha, as far as small molecules are concerned, which is amazing. 
They also compared that to the linear form and saw that the linear form was found with several logs less affinity, which is also important because that means that the cyclization is important for its affinity. If you have the linear form, it doesn't bind nearly as tightly as a cyclized form. So the cyclization might be able to help with binding affinity. And they also compared this with R6A, which is the last peptide, it's the best peptide up until this study. And both the linear and cyclic found it better. Yes? Is that cyclic binding motif, I mean, do you find that increased binding affinity in all small cyclic? Absolutely not. Okay. Do you want me to, or uh, I'll elaborate later. Okay. Okay. So, next thing they wanted to see is if this helped with protease resistance. So what they did is they took their peptide in the cyclic form and in the linear form and looked at how much they retained after incubating it um, with chymotrypsin over time. And what they saw is that the linear peptide degraded much more quickly than the cyclic form. So cyclization might actually help with being stable in proteases. Is everybody with me there? So what you're trying to figure out here is how how resistant to degradation this, this is. Exactly. So like if you took the linear form and incubated it with this amount of chymotrypsin after like three minutes, half of it's gone. But it might it's gonna last about three times as long if it's cyclized, which is really necessary for drugs. Yes. Five minutes? Okay, I'll go quickly. Okay. But the thing is, they weren't very happy with this. It didn't last as long as they wanted it to. They wanted to increase um, its serious stable ability, or its ability to, res to resist protease degradation even more. So now what they did was something different. They took that pool seven that they had analyzed before, their bucket of toys, but then what they did is they added protease. They added protease for a little while, and then they threw it at the dartboard. If the proteins were degraded, they probably weren't going to stick to the dartboard, and we weren't going to see them in our selections anymore. So they did this for three rounds, and ended up picking three peptides that were much, much more stable than what they had started with, even in the cyclized form from before. And what they found was that at all three of these, all three of their peptides, as well as the peptide from the last selection, had, while they had multiple possible cut sites, we're only observing one, which is very interesting if you guys want to go into how chymotrypsin works. But uh, we can talk about that in more detail later if any of you guys have any questions about that. Um, then what they did is they looked at the half-life of their proteins um, in chymotrypsin and saw that the linear half-life was lower than the cyclic half-life in almost all of the cases except the last one. So maybe cyclization isn't always great for being resistant to protease degradation. But in a lot of cases, it may be. Uh, you can talk about that in more detail later. Um, they also saw that they're getting cyclic half-lives much longer in their second selection than they were in the first. So before, they were lasting like two and a half minutes in this, in this assay. But then after their new round of protease selection, they were getting like 90 minute half-lives. That's not long enough for a drug, but this is with chymotrypsin at a relatively high concentration. So next what they looked at was serum stability. This is like, you take your blood serum, it's got some proteases in it, a whole bunch of different proteases, not just chymotrypsin, and at a much lower concentration than they were doing in the previous assay. And what they found is that the half-lives for these proteins were on target with what you want for a drug. So before they did the protease selection, they were lasting about 20 seconds. But now, they're, or I'm sorry, 20 minutes. But now they're lasting several hours, sometimes even more than a day, which is what you want for a drug. Because you don't want your drug to go away in less than a day. And so this makes it so that these drugs could be much more useful therapeutically instead of just as pro-drugs. Um, so what's important to take away, oh, another thing that was very interesting is that they didn't have as good binding as they had previously. So the protease selection got rid of the best binders because those were not necessarily stable to proteases. But then what was left had slightly worse binding, still strong, 
Like, if you guys remember from a while ago, we talked about how strong drugs are. You want a good drug has about 20 nanomolar affinity for its target, and there's a pretty wide distribution as to what small drug, how the kind of affinity small drugs have. On the first drug that we found had 2.1 nanomolar affinity, which is very strong. And the ones after the second selection were between 9 and 90 nanomolar, which is still pretty good. Still possible, you can still use it as a therapeutic. Okay, so what I want you guys to take away from this, that it's really hard to make a drug. We don't have a whole bunch of different ways to target drugs that aren't enzymes. This is one way that we can potentially grab onto a, uh, a protein and prevent it from grabbing onto other things. And the way that we're doing that is with a selection. It lets you look at a whole bunch of different things at the same time and find ones that work really, really well. Um, and now, for the first time, we're actually able to find ones that are resistant to protease degradation, which makes it much more promising for just going from a pro-drug to an actual drug.